All right, everybody, welcome back. We have just a few minutes to go till showtime. Hi, everybody, welcome to the Educator Speaker Series, Using Visual Thinking Strategies in the Classroom to Increase Inclusion Through Democratic Discussion. This is our final teacher program of the year, so thank you so much for coming out. I know it's probably been a very busy day at school, and we really appreciate your presence here. We hope you will find the program applicable and of value to you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Laura Schilling, and I'm the content specialist for teacher programs at LACMA. I am a white woman with curly blonde hair, and today I'm wearing an orange t-shirt, and I have a very unexciting blank white wall behind me. So to give you a little bit of a background on the Educator Speaker Series, it's a relatively new LACMA program. It's two years old now. And um, in this program, we invite K-12 teachers to give presentations and workshops on topics in art education that center on criticality and social justice. We believe it is important to elevate the amazing work that you all are doing in your classrooms and provide you with a platform to share with your peers. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Jean Hoyle and Allison Kaler from the Museum of Contemporary Art, as well as classroom teachers, Louis Barreto and Danielle Howard. Together, they will be demonstrating visual thinking strategies or VTS, and also talking about how this strategy can help create more inclusive student-centered classrooms. If you would like to access captions today, please click captions on your Zoom toolbar and then click show captions. My AV colleagues are providing tech support, so if you have any questions for them, please feel free to send a message to Jose or Nika Noor. They both have LACMA AV in their Zoom names. And let's go to the next slide. I would like to share the following land acknowledgement. LACMA recognizes that we occupy land in Los Angeles County originally and and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tataviam, Serrano, Keech, and Chumash peoples. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of the lands and waters in Los Angeles County. And I'm going to add um, the Native Land website in the chat. Um, definitely check it out when you have a chance. This is a really amazing mapping resource for identifying indigenous lands across the globe. Next slide. I also would like to share our story maps resources with you. Um, chances are you've seen these before. I share them at every single program because we really want you to use them. Um, we spend a lot of time creating these. They highlight artworks in the LACMA collection as well as special exhibitions through artist bios, artwork descriptions, discussion questions, lesson plans for hands-on activities, videos, and more. Um, these are intended to be useful tools for integrating art into your classrooms, and topics range from social-emotional learning and STEAM to individual artist achievements and the significance of art at different points in both American and global history. But definitely take some time to check those out. I'm also going to drop the link in the chat for you. And then we'll go to the next slide. We have a very robust agenda for this program, and I want to make sure that you are all on the same page with us about what is going on. Um, we will first be hearing from Jean and Allison from MOCA. Um, they're going to be talking about VTS and MOCA's Contemporary Art Start program. After that, you will have the opportunity to experience VTS yourselves. Um, Allison Kaler from MOCA and high school teacher Louis Barreto will each demonstrate VTS with two different artworks from the LACMA collection. After that, we will hear from elementary teacher Danielle Howard, as well as from Luis Barreto about their experiences using BTS in their classrooms and the impact it has had on their students. And then at the end, we will open up the conversation to you, the audience, um, with a Q&A. So I will now introduce Jean Hoyle and Allison Kaler, who will be starting us off today. Jean has led school and teacher programs at MOCA since 2003. As an artist, educator, and nonprofit administrator, she works to create collaborative environments that center learners, reflection, and shared leadership. Jean studied at the Maryland Institute College of Art and Bank Street College. And Allison has worked since 2007 as an arts educator in both a classroom and museum setting, fostering students' creative, social, and emotional growth through art. Allison is committed to establishing partnerships and building relationships as an educator and museum administrator. She holds a BA in cultural studies, 
an MA in Education, and a BA in Studio Arts, Spanish, and International Intercultural Studies. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Jean and Allison. Thanks for being with us here today. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Hello. I'm honored to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Laura and the team at LACMA. And thank you, Alice Bebbington, president of the Museum Educators of Southern California, recently of MOCA and now at the Hammer, ah, for your role in making this program happen. Um, I'm Jean Hoyle. I'm the Associate Director of Education at MOCA, where I direct school, teacher, and family programs, namely Contemporary Art Start, which Laura mentioned, our in-depth partnership program for third through 12th grade teachers and their students. Um, I am a white woman with pulled back light brown and gray hair, mm, chunky glasses, and I'm wearing a highly fashionable striped jacket. Um, this afternoon and evening, we're going to talk about how frequent, carefully facilitated discussions can build inclusivity among learners. We'll look at how the teaching methodology, visual thinking strategies, thrives contemporary art start at MOCA and our pursuit to make education more inclusive. Uh, we'll discuss two works of art from LACMA's collection, uh, facilitated by Allison Kaler, lead sen ed senior educator at MOCA, and Louis Barreto, a six-year graphic design and AP art and art history teacher at the Academy of Art and Technology at Cleveland High School in Reseda. Lewis has participated in Contemporary Art Start for two years. We will also then be joined by Daniel How Danielle Howard, who teaches fourth grade at Dr. Owen L. Knox Elementary in South Los Angeles. She has been a critical member of the CAS community for over 10 years. Uh, both Lewis and Danielle serve on the MOCA Teacher Advisory Council, and they will talk about what makes them stick around at MOCA so long. But before then, um, it might be good to get a shared definition of the word inclusion. Often inclusion refers specifically to including students with disabilities. In this context, I'm using the term to describe a welcoming learning environment, welcoming learning environments that are for everyone. Allison is now going to read a passage from Bell Hooks Teaching Critical Thinking to set the stage. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jade. And one more next slide. Perfect. All right. So ways of knowing expressed in conversations are what draw listeners in and provide them with intellectual nourishment. Much of what we remember, what stays with us, emerged in conversations. It is my hope that future educators will talk more and more together and with students so that the model of conversation as a way to learn will have its rightful place as a genuine location for serious and rigorous thought. That's by Bell Hooks from Conversation in Teaching Critical Thinking. And I'll pass next slide and I'll pass it back over to Jean. Thanks, Allison. So conversations are a vehicle for growth social, verbal, emotional, and cognitive growth. And inclusion fuels all of this growth. We know what exclusionary policies and practices can do and are doing right now. Inclusion is urgent to literally protect people and to help them thrive. We need it especially now after the pandemic when so many of students' communication and social learning skills have been stunted. The good news is that inclusive conversation is a skill. Being a contributing member, a speaker, and a listener takes practice, but we can practice this in supportive environments and prepare kids to have them with others. It can become a model for how we encounter new ideas that challenge our own. It makes us collectively smarter, but an inclusive learning environment doesn't occur instantly. For lasting skills to develop, students have to practice consistently and over a period of time. They need to get used to the feeling of discomfort that accompanies growth and fosters a sense of inclusion. To do that, teachers need a reliable methodology that targets the skill and that they know will work consistently. This is where visual thinking strategies comes in. It's an open-ended, inquiry-based discussion method that teachers use to facilitate um, open-ended discussions about works of art, excuse me. Uh, in it, facilitators ask strategic questions and paraphrase 
responses to bring more and more people into the conversation. You need to create a consistently welcoming environment and you need your questions, you need fair questions that everyone can answer. In addition to methods and curriculum, to do this, teachers need to have their own inclusive learning environments in which they can learn how to facilitate these democratic discussions and experience learning for themselves in a supportive environment. So at MOCA, we have developed CAS, our year-long uh, museum classroom partnership that includes personalized PD throughout the year, multiple guided museum visits, a diverse and lively discussion-based classroom curriculum, and inclusive family programs, those four major components. This year, CAS is in classrooms in 47 schools across Los Angeles and now beyond through our new online track. Since the start of the pandemic, we have actually grown by 50% in the number of teachers we serve each year. But what I wanna point out here is that DTS greases the wheel of contemporary art start. This learner-centered approach to learn, this learner-centered approach um, drives our goals, our curriculum, our professional development programs for teachers, and our management style. It helps us create inclusive communities for students and teachers. And we will hear from Danielle and Lewis, who will talk about um, how CAS and BTS make their classrooms more inclusive. But enough talk. Let's talk about some art. I'm going to hand it over to Allison. Thanks, Jean. Uh, next slide, please. So we believe that the best way to learn what VTS is, is to experience it for yourselves. Uh, so I'm gonna facilitate this next conversation with you all uh, using an image from LACMA's collection. And I just invite you all to participate in this conversation as your full and authentic selves. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so to begin, I just wanna invite everyone to take a quiet moment together to look closely at this image. All right, and it's okay if you're still taking a moment to look, um, but I'd love to begin the conversation. Uh, so I invite you to participate either in the chat or you can participate by unmuting to share aloud, uh, whatever feels most comfortable for you. So I wanna be mindful to share the space. Uh, so once again, I wanna start this conversation and just ask everyone what's going on here. All right, things are getting started. I see in the chat, Erica says, it's a family portrait. All right, thanks, Erica. So really kind of thinking about both maybe the medium or maybe the content here, the subject matter, thinking that this is a specific, um, maybe a portrait or a rendering of a family of some folks that are related. Uh, and Erica, I'd love to hear more about that. What did you see that made you say uh, they might be a family? And feel free to unmute to respond or share that in the chat, Erica. What did you see that makes you say this might be a family? I'll unmute myself so that I don't have to <laughs> type it all out in the chat. Um, I think just the way they seem like they're lovingly holding one another. So just I'm assuming our parental figures or your guardians or some type of family member. Um, yeah, just really uh, holding one another in this yeah. posture stance. Yeah, thanks so much, Erica. So yeah, really paying close attention to like kind of the body language and the way the limbs are um, rendered in this image and noticing kind of both the physical and maybe emotional closeness of these figures here implied there. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Yeah, what more can we find? Hi, my, um, my name is Saleh. My first impression was um, a collage like Roman bear it reminded me of that. And then I'm like, no, this is a painting. And um, and like the um, the young lady before me, it does seem like it's, you know, a family portrait, but it's 
I'm still trying to feel what is the meaning of not showing the um, the parent's face or what are they hiding behind? You know, I kind of get a feeling like they're hiding something like, yeah, it seems like on the surface it's a loving family, but what it, what's being hidden? And because of the expression of the young boy, there's more to it. It seems like there's more to it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sally. Uh, so it sounds like I hear you first kind of um, making an immediate connection perhaps with another visual artist, um, wondering if this might be a piece by them. And then I hear you also wondering about the medium, right, of perhaps this is a collage or perhaps this is a painting. But then I hear you also really building upon Erica's idea that perhaps this might be a rendering of a family portrait. Um, then so where Erica was noticing maybe some feelings of comfort and familiarity, it sounds like you're offering a slightly different interpretation of maybe the tone and really kind of sitting in a place of wondering of why um, the figures who you're identifying as maybe parental figures, why their faces seem to be obscured and perhaps what is the meaning behind that? Perhaps there's something darker, something um, being hidden there. Did I hear that right, Soleil? Yes. Uh, all right, thanks so much. Uh, what more can we find? And I'm seeing some comments in the chat here. I see Carol says, hiding faces of adults. So thanks, Scott. Sounds like really agreeing with kind of Sully's idea of like what's drawing up, being um, drawing your attention is perhaps the obscured or hidden faces of perhaps the, could be the older figures there as well. And then I also see Sierra saying what jumps out to me first is the contrast of the dull gray skin with the vibrant, colorful fabrics in the background. And background. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Sierra. So it sounds like you're really kind of noticing maybe some more of the more technical aspects of this work. Really noticing the contrast or like juxtaposition between um, these grayscale tones that are used to render the figures, in contrast with these really viv vivid, vibrant um, patterns and colors around them. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. What more can we find? I might move it to one more comment in the chat. I see Catherine says, I see a celebration. So yeah, identifying that maybe an action happening here, thinking there's some kind of festivity. And Catherine, I'd love to hear more about that. What did you see that made you say there might be a celebration happening here? You can feel free well, to unmute. I, oh yeah, thank you. I, I see <clears throat> they look like they're dressed up. They've put effort into putting on fancier types of clothes and they have balloons and they're and someone's taking a picture of them in the scene that that they've prepared for. So I think that it's celebrating something because of the the balloons and the um, clothing that they've chosen and the way they're positioned. Like here we are at this event. Yeah, thanks so much, Catherine. So thinking about thinking about these figures, not only the way that they seem to be posed, but maybe what they're wearing seems to be reflective to you of like some kind of special occasion, perhaps an elevated apparel. Um, and you're also noticing that perhaps there's ob other objects in the scene with them that might be typical of a celebration. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, what more can we find? I'm gonna highlight them two more comments in the chat here. Uh, JS says the child is centered. Yeah, so really noticing, really considering the um, specific figure here is perhaps the younger child where some other folks have been focusing on me, perhaps could be the older uh, figures here, really thinking that this child, what could be a child or the younger figure is really drawing your attention is more centered in this image. And then I see Sierra is saying, another kind of tension I see is the fact that the feminine figure mother is more obscured and physically separated from the child than the masculine figure or father. And the green balloon separates her from the man and child. Yeah, thanks so much, Sierra. So like really digging deeply into the placement of these figures and how they're close, their um, seeming closeness or their seeming separation kind of relative to one another. And to you, it really looks like, and you're also really kind of thinking about um, perhaps parental roles, perhaps a mother, perhaps a father, and really noticing some contrast in those, um, that distance and connection you're seeing here. Yeah. yeah thanks so much. Yeah, what more can we find? What more can we find? Maybe one more, have time for one more comment here in the chat 
or one more comment out loud, what more can we find? All right, so yeah, I see Carol in the ch chat says geometric shapes, swirls, dots, flowers everywhere, and colors are all the same brightness. Yeah, thanks, Carol. So really kind of noticing um, what's kind of encasing these figures or what's like the, filling the background in negative space, really using some technical terms to describe these geometric shapes, swirls, really noticing the kind of um, detailed, vibrant, patterned backgrounds and surroundings. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you all so much for looking so closely at this image together. Thank you. Thank you for participating and sharing your ideas. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Jean to lead a reflection here. So next slide, please. Thank you, Allison. So I'd like to ask you all, how did it feel to participate in this discussion, whether you made a comment or if you listened, how did it feel? I like making the comments because I like getting, um, listening to the feedback and listening to um, how other people interpret what's happening. And then it gives you another perspective of how to see it again. So it's almost like re-seeing the piece for the first time again. Thank you. So enjoying it as a chance to express your own ideas, but to see how they change as more ideas come into play. And you said, seen it over and over again. Thank you. What more? I see JS saying all ideas were heard and valued. And I guess I'd like to ask JS, um, what did you experience that made you say that all comments were valued? Yeah, I think each comment was given space and um, allowed to be fully expressed and then repeated back and then asked, did I get that right? Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. So um, hearing language multiple times uh, feels, feels good. And Erica agrees saying she felt um, validated. Um, in the ways that the teacher acknowledged everyone's comments. So similar ideas there and the sort of um, emotionally uh, welcoming component with that validation as well, it sounds. And just one last question. Um, what more, are there any other comments? I really like the style and the flatness of the clothing. It doesn't really show any volume, but because of the placement of everybody and the balloons, it you do get a sense of, you know, it's a it's a jacket. A body is inside this jacket. You know, a body is inside the young boy's sweater. You know, it's it's it has that that's why I, I um referenced it to um uh roman uh bear because of the it looks like a cutout even though i can tell it's not it's it has to be well i think it's a painting but um i like that yeah like that style yeah so just appreciating this um sort of flat vibrant uh painting style from which these figures emerge Thank you, just enjoying the work. Thank you. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to Lewis, who is gonna lead us in a second discussion. And this time I'd really like to ask you to um, notice what you see Lewis doing to encourage the validation um, that, that was brought up here. And uh, what, did you, what you see him doing. So Lewis, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, next. Jean and Allison. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, great. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to be leading the second session of BTS. 
Uh, so this is going to be the next image we're going to be looking at. And just like Allison, I'm going to ask for a uh, moment of silence as we look at this image and observe what's going on. And then I'll be back with a series of questions. So let's quietly look at this image together. All right, so I want to start our conversation, our VTS session today, with asking the same question of what is going on in this image? And again, please feel free to unmute yourself or write it in the chat. I'm going to say it's like a lazy Sunday or uh, you know, there's an event going on, you know, like they're going to church or maybe a graduation or, you know, a celebration that's happening. Great. Thank you, Sally, for um, introducing our, our conversation. So noticing the, the, the situation, the environment in which our characters are in right now, uh, this possible celebration or some kind of event that is going to be happening that these characters will be um, being a part of. And uh, Sally, what do you see that makes you say that these characters are, will be participating in some kind of event or celebration of some sort? Because of the style of dress, it's, you know, it seems like, you know, they're, it's not a, everyone's in jeans, although the young boy is in jeans, but it's kind of stylish in a sense. You know, he's making his little statement and um, everyone else is dressed like, you know, they're making a statement. And the statement, you know, to me is they have an event to attend. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, and yes, uh, going further into the characters, right, the, the costumes that the characters wear, reminiscent of some kind of events that we may have participated in. Uh, looking at also, uh, I noticed you mentioned the posture, focusing on the, the smaller character, the, what appears to be a little boy in the, in the front, um, in his posture, giving off this impression um, and so reminiscent of some kind of event or celebration that these characters will be either partaking in or have or partaken in. Thank you so much, Sally, for uh, starting our conversation. What more can we find in this image? I see uh, Sierra in the chat said, I'm sorry, Carol in the chat said, everyone looking in a different direction. So yeah, noticing again the, the characters, the subjects in this piece, uh, not only Sally looking at the, the costumes, the, what they wear and the posture, but then also looking at the gaze of these characters, uh, how these characters are looking at what appears to be in all sorts of different directions. Good. And then further, I see that uh, Sierra says, this is also seems like it could be a family portrait, but it's much more relaxed than the last one. The poses are very casual, but the outfits are very fashionable. Right. So seeing this theme, uh, Sierra, thank you so much for your comment. Seeing this theme of costume wear, of, of, of this family identity that is being portrayed in these two pieces. Uh, Sierra, what do you see that makes you say that this could also be a family portrait? Okay, it's kind of noisy where I am, so it's probably kind of a lot of like background noise, but um, I guess just the way that it is, but someone mentioned that like, there are multiple generations being grouped here and it looks like they could be posed outside of a family home and like the idea that like they're going to an event or they're just kind of like it seems just the way that they're posed around each other feels very comfortable so I guess that's sort of what makes me think like this is in a way a kind of family portrait but it's not you know following that tradition where everyone needs to be like standing like this they feel very like tense it just seems a lot more like more like a it's like almost like a candid photo, so not, except not because they're all very fashionably dressed and also it's very like on the stage, but it still has maybe goes to that impression of it being kind of candid, like they're just caught naturally in this moment. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for your um, conversation, Sierra. And if I may um, uh, apologize, uh, JS, I didn't see your your previous comment. So re reflecting on this idea that, that you mentioned of multiple generations uh, stemming from JS's um, uh, conversation in the chat. Uh, we're seeing multiple generations, what appears to be multiple generations in this image. So giving that sense of family or this, you know, this uh, sense of belonging with each character, they're not just some random or, uh, group of, of individuals. Um, and if I were, if I could hear you correctly, you were mentioning again, the, the 
casualty of their poses, um, how they seem more comfortable and candid. Is that, was that correct, Sierra? Sorry, I gave a thumbs up. I don't know if you can see, but yeah. Oh, okay, great. Uh, yes, the, the new Zoom kind of messes me up, so I can't see all the settings very well. But good, thank you so much for that, Sierra. Um, and so let's keep going. What more can we find in this image? Um, and I see Erica says portraits that are representative of identity. Great. So yeah, really honing in on this idea of identity, uh, possibly the family portrait or family identity in this in a group of individuals. Uh, Erica, can you elaborate a little bit more? What do you see in this image that makes you say this is a represent uh, a representation of identity? Sure. Um, I would suggest identity just because. Um, although this is a photograph, each individual is em emitting different energy. Um, so we have like the figure that's on the foreground, kind of really casual, kind of just hanging out on the steps versus the person that's dressed in white. It's uh, to me, white seems like angelic. So her energy is much more calming. And we have the little the little kid up in the front with the blue mean mugging his his the camera, the photographer. Um, so just giving off a really cool, fun vibe. Um, and again, I also agree with everyone's comments on the potential of it being a family portrait, just like Sierra mentioned, maybe a family portrait just because it is in front of what could be a family home. Um, maybe parents in the background. Um, so yeah. Awesome, thank you, Erica. So, it, um, so again, noticing yeah the, the postures of these characters and and as you mentioned, the vibe or the tone uh, of these characters and what, what the kind of emotional tone they are giving off. It, you, you mentioned the character in the foreground, very relaxed, very in their own sense of space. Uh, the the character right after them in that white uh, costume, right, very angelic, as you mentioned, and then the the child uh, facing directly the camera, right, this almost confrontation with the viewer. And then also uh, elaborating uh, on this idea of family or, or identity, right, of this group of individuals, noticing the environment that they're in, uh, leading the staircase into what appears to be what could be uh, the older family members, maybe parents uh, in the family home or on the stoop of the family home. Uh, so this could relate back to the idea of family and, and identity. Thank you so much, Erica, for that. Um, let's, let's keep rocking. Uh, Mary in the chat mentioned, as in the previous image, the child is the only figure looking directly at the viewer. So uh, great um, mention there, Mary. Yeah, noticing how in between our two images are, we still have some similarities in the visual context of these images and our subjects and how the viewer is engaged in these images. Uh, so uh, going off your comment, right? Again, the child in the front um, directly looking at or confronting the viewer and going back even earlier to Sally's point of the their posture, right? Very um, um, comfort, not confrontational, but very uh, comfortable, very uh, there right? in the in the moment. Good. Um, and I'm going to go with Christina in the chat as well. Uh, feels very and quotes a day in the life. Yeah, uh, Christina, what do you see that makes you say that this image gives off this impression of a day in the life? Um, just the way it's um, laid out, you know, it's in their front, it would seem to be the front yard of someone's house. Um, maybe they're getting ready to go somewhere. The people in the background seem to have like a, a little bit more formal att attire. Um, so maybe they're getting ready to go, but it's very casual, especially the person in the front filing their nails, just kind of looking at, you know, just kind of hanging out, it's a day in the life, maybe we're getting ready to go somewhere, somewhere special or have an event, but it's just a snapshot of my day, you know, of a day, maybe it's a special day, maybe it's a day that they're going to a party or people are coming over, but it's, it's a day in our home, you know, opening kind of that, that window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that. And again, kind of summarizing the, all the all the conversations about mood and tones and and this idea of the family and, and the environment, right? Uh, summing up how the character, the, the character in the foreground is filing their nails, very casual. But then also noticing, again, the, the environment of the home behind them, this connection to whether they are part of this family group. Um, and I believe it was Sierra, if I remember correctly, you mentioned um, 
I, I'm sorry, actually, Christina, can, can you backtrack real quick? You mentioned something about um, after talking about the character in the foreground, you mentioned some kind of attitude, was it, or some kind of emotional tone that the characters gave off? If, if I remember correctly, could you repeat that statement? Was that for Sierra? Uh, for you, Christine. Oh, um, no, I, I mean, it just, uh, for me, it just felt very, um, like maybe we're getting ready to go somewhere or do something. Um, so it doesn't feel frantic or stressful. It feels very relaxed. Um, but again, just the way that, that they're dressed, you know, some look a little bit more formal. Um, but again, it just does it, it just feels, um, relaxed. Like we're, we're gonna, we're gonna go somewhere. We're gonna host something, you know, there's a, there's definitely a vibe going on, but, um, it's not frantic. It's not stressful. It's not sad or angry. It's just, it's, you know, as I'm walking by the street, this is maybe something I might see as I'm walking by and this, this group of people might be getting ready for something. Mm, okay. Great, thank you for that clarification. So yeah, the, this idea of the candid, and I believe that was what um, uh, Sierra or Erica was talking about. Also, I wanna connect that idea back, but as you said, right, it's just, although this is a photograph, we acknowledge that this may be a photograph, um, the idea of the posture still being very natural, very candid, very a day in the life, very normal. Something as you said, like if we were walking by, this would just be a normal situation environment where these people look like they're about to go somewhere or do something together. Great, thank you so much, Christina, for that and your clarification. I also want to add because um, the other thing is it doesn't necessarily have to be a celebration. The celebration could be at the home and they are just outside a part of the, um, the party. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is because the young girl is really kind of relaxed and everybody is in, um, you know, in a different dress, but it is some type of celebration going on. And they could just be outside, um, taking a moment, you know, away from the crowd inside, because this is, is, this is reminiscent of um, my family. So that's kind of why I kind of can, when I'm thinking about it, as I'm thinking about it, it's like, no, they ain't going anywhere. They're, the party is there at the house. You know, they just are outside enjoying the scenery and maybe, you know, just watching the other people walk by or what's going on. You know, or they could be visiting from out of town and just, you know, checking out the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Sally, for, for your point. Um, so, yeah, expanding this idea of, of the family of the celebration, right? Um, your ideas of possibly this this party or this event or this celebration is not happening. They're not going anywhere, but per se, it's already happening in the scene inside the home. And it looks maybe these characters are, as you said, like a little time of respite outside, relaxing, taking in the time, the moment, the space, um, in a very tranquil space, right away from that party or away from that celebration. And, and again, connecting it back to your personal experiences of how, how you feel like that. Like you said, like they, they're not going anywhere, right? This is just space. Um, and they're just enjoying their time and maybe watching others as they walk by down the street or you know, just taking in taking in the space, the environment. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'll take one last um, point and then we'll, we'll call it here. Uh, Carol says, two figures on the steps are very formally dressed, one in white and one in black, reflecting the colors in the dress of the other figures in the middle and foreground. Awesome. So yeah, connecting back to that idea, I believe it was either Erica or Mary, um, the idea of the, the generational changes. We see the younger generation, the, what looks to be the adolescent generation, and possibly could be the parent generation in the background, and how those two characters in the front and the foreground uh, have visually similar visual similarities to our characters in the background. So is there some kind of relationship there between them? Again, tying back the, all these ideas that we've had about uh, family and family identity. Awesome. Uh, I'm sorry, Carol, would you, um, would you like to add on? What more do you see in this image? Yeah, I, I don't know why, but now I almost feel like the man who's sitting on the step mm -hmm. is either getting married or with the woman in white, that they're a couple. I, don't, I just got that feeling. You know, okay. He's, he's sitting there. I don't know. 
you know, I mean, I don't add, I know content and we, we, I don't know what it's about, but it all of a sudden I picked up on what that person said about it, something that's already happened and they've already maybe gotten married or a ceremony together, but they're both in white. Mm -hmm. And I thought so yeah, interesting with a red bow tie. It looks like our red tie. Yeah. Right. So yeah, building off your comment, right, and and also building off Salé's comment of the the celebration, the environment that possibly already happened on the outside or the inside of the home. Um, but also noticing right those visual cues that we see the the characters in the back, black and the white, possibly referring to some kind of wedding or some kind of uh, communion between these two characters that we see in the background. Um, so is this is this a moment before or after the the events, right? Maybe it has already um, taken place. Great. Um, and I, we're going to end it here. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Beautiful job, Louis. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you all so much for participating in that conversation. As I'd love to take a moment to reflect again um, and just ask everyone, what did you notice either myself or Lewis doing to facilitate these conversations or these discussions? What did you notice the facilitators doing? Listening. You guys actually were listening to what we said and were able to um, repeat it back, but also adding to it. You know, it's like it was, it was still, there was, um, there's one thing with uh, with um, Robert. I didn't think the painting was a was his work because I know his work. But when it was facilitated back, that's kind of what was interpreted hmm. when the person spoke and they they said that I thought it may have been this particular artist, and that's not what I said. But it's it's just you know it's just a slight difference, but it's still like you guys are getting a whole lot of information and then you're trying to, you know, bring it back to have that conversation. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Yeah, so really noticing really, really active intentional listening on part of the facilitators and kind of that, um, the rephrasing or the paraphrasing back to kind of make, to demonstrate that active listening, those checking for understandings to make sure we heard correctly. And yeah, and then I'm noticing in a moment of perhaps when a facilitator, when I did not hear your comment correctly, that there's a way to kind of correct that and check in on that in that paraphrase and in reflecting back. Yeah, thank you so much, Sally. Yeah, what more? What more did you notice the facilitator is doing? Yeah, Alice, I see your hand. What more? Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I just really appreciated both you and Lewis, um, uh, you know, returning to those, those same questions again and again of like, like you're doing now, Allison, of what more can we find? Um, but yeah, that like, uh, what do you see that makes you say that? And there were so many exciting comments that came from, especially that question of what do you see that makes you say? that. Um, so I feel like I learned so much from uh, the, the folks who spoke on in these image discussions because of that, like following up. Yeah, thanks so much, Alice. So yeah, and like an appreciation for maybe that structure of VTS, not only of those opening questions of what can we find here, but then that, that second question to kind of dig in a little more, more deeply um, of what do you see that makes you say something. I'm really reflecting about the joy as a, as a listener participant and hearing Folks really kind of dig into their own thoughts and dig into the image with that. Yeah, thanks, Alice. Yeah. What more? I see a few comments I want to highlight in the chat here. Yeah, Carol saying, um, repeated what we said and used our names. Yeah, because really kind of building on Sally's idea of that repeating and like reflecting, thinking back to the participants. And Sierra saying, I appreciated Lewis's using our names so we could in turn learn each other's names and start thinking as a group of collaborators instead of a group of strangers. Yeah, thanks so much, Sierra. So you're really noticing like the technique of calling folks by their names and linking comments together to really help build that community of a collective wondering rather than just, yeah, a group of strangers, as you said. Yeah, thanks, Sierra. 
And see Christina saying, they pushed us to clarify our thinking and use evidence as to why we thought that. Yeah, thanks so much. So kind of um, building on Alice's comment on that second question of what do you see that makes you say that is really kind of that skill building of build, backing up um, claims with evidence and kind of really centering the discussion back to the image there um, to help, both help model and clarify thinking and also help kind of, um, yeah, focus attention to the image. Yeah, thanks so much. What more? What more did you notice the facilitator doing? I think then I see Christina building on that idea, saying that they also rephrase to check for clarity and understanding and also connecting our ideas. Yeah, thanks so much. So really kind of, Christina thinking kind of similar to what Sally was saying of like that paraphrasing, reflecting, thinking back, not only for each participant, but for the group, right? To really kind of follow that collective wondering and collective conversation. Um, checking for understanding to making sure we heard things correctly, make sure we really um, being putting things in different words to make sure we're fully listening and hearing ideas. And then also use, doing that linking comments that Sierra was mentioning of linking and connecting common ideas together. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, any more final thoughts on what did you notice the facilitator doing? And if not, that's all right. I'll pass it back over to Jean. If something comes to you, please feel free to share that in the chat. And yeah, thank you so much for reflecting together. Hi, wow, thank you for the masterful facilitations. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be in your groups. Um, I wanted to just uh, point out to the next slide, if I could, um, I won't go into a lot of detail but this is a diagram of the structure of VTS. It's deceptively simple because there are basically three questions that get asked, but it actually, there's a lot. There's the paraphrasing, as you notice, the linking of comments, um, the, the fresh vocabulary or expansive vocabulary that helps people build on their own and others' ideas. So what we do in Contemporary Art Start is we give teachers plenty of time to not only learn about it, but to practice it and to receive supportive coaching up to seven times in their first year of the program. Uh, so now, Danielle, I'll turn the floor over to you to talk about what VTS looks like in your classroom. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so hello everybody, good evening. Um, my name is Danielle Howard, I teach fourth and fifth grade. I've been doing it for doing that for about 23 years, currently at Dr. Owen L. Knox Elementary School. And um, just a little bit about how CAST is important to me. So I know I became a connoisseur of art as a direct result of participating in VTS via CAST um, some 10-ish years ago. Um, so I used to be the person who, if I went to museums, I could get through a museum in 30 minutes. I would popcorn from piece to piece with little reflection. But, and you know, before that I was going on field trips to museums before I started participating in CAST, but it wasn't until I participated in Contemporary Art Start and actually engaging in BTS um, as a learner when we have our um, our workshops. Um, it was through that that I acquired the habits of a true museum patron. And so my goal is to actually instill the same in my students. And so I hope that with this presentation, um, I will be able to um, show you, and well, that all of us will be able to show you just how we do that. Um, and so here through VTS, because of CAS, I got to, I actually found a favorite artist years ago. And that favorite artist is Carrie James Marshall. And I got to meet him when he was invited um, to a speaker series um, at the um, Mocha Museum. Um, next slide. Um, so first off, um, as far as um, VTS being inclusive, the best aspect about it is that all ideas are valued um, because there's no one right answer. And um, the nature of, um, of the way that students respond, it's just, it's just naturally allows itself for that. And um, 
So through VTS, one of the things that I've been able to notice within my students is a real growth in their ability to hold accountable conversations in the classroom. Now, of course, that's always different from class to class. Um, you know, I've had much more success with other classes um, in, in comparison to some others. But the big thing about that is that it's a space that we can really practice this, um, the skills of active listening in a very, um, in a very real and valid um, situation. And so, um, yes, you know, students, um, Yes, um, like one of, oh, sorry, one of the, I noted here something I heard someone say in one of the VTS discussions we had here tonight. Um, so one of you noted here that listening is important, that you noticed that the facilitators, Allison and Lewis, were really listening to what you were saying. And, um, and that made me realize as well that as teachers, we are modeling active listening for our students because you, you know, the only way that you can really paraphrase what your students are saying is by being an active listener. So we are tuning everything out and we're showing our students how to tune everything out. We're grounded in the artwork. We're pointing out the artwork. That's what our hands are doing. They aren't busy doing other things. And so it's, a, um, um, and that also shows the students that every idea is a valuable and a thoughtful idea. Next slide. Um, for instance, um, in this, um, in the artwork that's here, this is one that I shared with my students in class this year. And in this artwork, for example, there are details that every viewer would notice, while there are other details that may not so prominently jump out. And this snippet of conversation shows how the facilitator can frame a paraphrase um, to extend a student's understanding. So the student and seeing this artwork, her comment was that my impression is that I see the first people in America and it looks like a feast with skeletons. There's a turkey in the background. This was probably in the old days when they used to have a feast, but I'm pretty sure that it's fake anyways. And as the teacher, then my paraphrase went on to say um, to um, to validate her ideas, but also within that, you'll notice a little bit of framing to um, extend her thinking by supplying the, the word she was looking for. Because while she was talking, she was really trying to find this right word of, the, of what to call the first people in America. She was saying like, oh my gosh, oh gosh, what are they called? Oh, the first people in America. And then she went on. And so in my paraphrase, so you recognize this is an image of indigenous people um, so without overtly correcting her, you recognize this as an image of indigenous people because of the headwear and they are at a feast at some point in history. Uh, but when I said indigenous people, she actually was like, oh my gosh, yes, 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 that's what they're called, indigenous people. So she felt validated without feeling corrected. And I go on to say, but you are wondering if this is real. What do you see that makes you say they are there are indigenous people? So then that's grounding it back into the artwork. And her response was, um, finding evidence within the artwork. There's a person in the middle and the skeletons around with feathers in their hats. And that's how I see the people in books. And so she was able to uh, say a little bit more um, about, her, uh, about her thinking. Uh, next slide. Um, so the BTS process itself is um, presents itself as collaborative. Um, students can build off of one another's ideas um, and thinking. A lot of times you can almost see this little light bulb, imaginary light bulb go off over a student's heads when they're actively listening to what their classmates are saying. Sometimes you'll hear, you know, little side comments um, to themselves, just thinking out loud where a, a student will say, oh yeah, and um, sometimes um, one's um, idea sparks an idea from another student because their hand goes up. So while one student is talking, another student's hand raises because, and that to me is evidence that, oh, that kid said something and it makes me wanna say something now. It's giving me an idea because I heard my classmate um, share an idea. And um, so that's, um, you know, those are some things that just naturally would happen within the VTS discussion. And uh, another thing that it's really important for the facilitator to do, like Jean mentioned, is linking comments. Um, so um, if someone, if one of your students said an idea three comments ago, I can relate that back to um, 
uh, what someone is saying in this moment. So by using words like, oh, similarly to what Kendall said, or like Princess said earlier. And that's, you know, again, it's also building that community because it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's building a core of, it's showing that we have this sort of commonality of ideas. And um, the other, another thing that I do that is a collaborative in a bit of a different way beyond our classroom is post visit thank you letters. And that sort of makes a connection between the students and the, um, and the classroom educators that um, that shared with that led our discussions at the museum. And so through those thank you letters, they are able to connect even closer with the museum educators. And because I've been participating for so long, I identify the museum educators as my friends. And so I, you know, when I go like, oh, this is my friend Allison, or this is my friend Michelle, that's my friend Jean. And, um, and so then they feel like, oh, we, you know, we're writing letters to Miss Howard's friends. <laughs> So it's kind of um, kind of a neat connection for the students. And um, the next slide is going to show a little bit about how I use the Google Classroom space. So this is actually a relic from um, from the pandemic days when we were not meeting in person. And um, and it's something that I've just sort of carried over now as well into um, into the regular classroom space. So um, so basically following. Um, uh, during Zoom teaching, there were, you know, a lot of students were, if you were teaching during that time, a lot of students were resistant to talking. So this became, um, you know, a way for us to, um, to, to hold our conversations and to make sure that um, everyone got a chance to hear and respond and say their ideas. So now we use it as a way of sort of following the group VTS discussion. And so I use it as an independent work time activity um, related to an artwork that we may have discussed um, earlier that week or um, or that day, um, where students are able to share their ideas in much the same way with the same questioning and directly respond to one another. When students are a little more, um, um, I guess, capable of extending their ideas, um, I also will use this to ask, like, what was your first impression and what was your impression afterwards? And so um, every class is different. Um, so like this conversation, you can go to the next slide, has another conversation, um, but um, at the next slide. Oh, did I miss one? Okay, go back. Okay, I guess I accidentally took one out. Okay, so um, so every class is different. And so this group um, that I have this year is a largely a group of struggling writers, um, but this space is still a real invalid space that encourages reading and responding because they want to see what their classmates are saying. They want to respond to one another ideas. And so even though sometimes it's short, it's sweet, it's simple, um, but it still allows them to, re uh, to still um, get involved in that community building as well. And noticing that Kanaya can notice that, oh, I have the same idea as Oswaldo. Maybe we might talk about that later, but maybe I realize now Oswaldo and I had you know, a problem in class yesterday, but we agree about something about this artwork. And um, so it's a nice way for them to, um, to collaborate in that way. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so um, BTS again is um, learner centered because students carry the load and every voice is heard. So I selected, I actually selected this image because this was a museum visit um, a few years back. But um, what was really interesting here is that, you know, my class is there, they're discussing and talking about the artwork and the arrows pointing to two um, individuals are actually other museum patrons, some other adults that were there and just literally were so enthralled by the ideas that the students were sharing about the artwork. Like one of the adults there, she sat down. <laughs> she just made herself at home and sat down and she was just a quiet observer and the gentleman on the um, on the right hand side as well. And um, so it just it it just made me feel really proud of my students that they engaged some other adults in their own in their conversation and the ideas that they were sharing about the artwork. So I try to always tell them that um, that you're you know you're museum patrons and you know and understand how to look at and discuss artwork more than most adults do, and um, you know and they can take a lot of pride in that. Um, next slide. 
Um, so um, another way that um, we, um, that the learners can um, reflect and show their thinking is through uh, post-visit reflection. And so, um, so this is one of my students from this year and it basically, um, I'm, I, he wasn't in my group, so I'm not sure what artwork he was looking at, but it basically shows, um, you know, his draws, draws a picture of the artwork that he um, was most impressed by at the museum that day. And it says, um, what was your very first impression? And Kendall's response was, my very first impression was there's a, like a car and I know the car is a BMW and I like sports cars. <laughs> so that was his first idea about the artwork. And then the second question on the post-visit reflection, which by the way, this sheet is created by the MOCA CAS educators. Um, it asks, how did the conversation we had affect the way you saw the object? And so in this instance, um, he's able to demonstrate how his impression was impacted by attending to the discussion and, um, get an, and recognizing additional details about the artwork and valuing those details because of what his classmates said. So his response here is in the conversation, we talked about the man on the car and the car is a BMW. <laughs> and we, um, um, sorry, something about um, the man with the trees, sorry forgot what the other part was down there. But the point is, is that, you know, yes, he was still about this car being BMW, but they talked about the man on the car. So now he's got some ideas about that. And the trees that were in the background, he's got some ideas about that as well. Um, next slide. So um, and one other way is that once students are really comfortable with this framework of VTS, which is, you know, three questions, um, students can lead, um, can lead the discussions. And so the way that I really make sure I'm able to incorporate this is um, during, we have two field trips that we're able to take as members of CAS. And one part that's built into that is a public, um, is a, a, a street art, a public art walk. And so we can take a walking tour nearby the museum and see different works of public art that are um, in the neighborhoods. And so since I'm always corralling the students, trying to watch, make sure everybody's staying where they're supposed to be and not wandering off, it's um, a lot easier and it's, um, it's a great opportunity to have the students lead the VTS discussions in this way. And so in both of these images, there's two students standing closer to the artwork and they are um, fifth graders um, leading the, the discussion. And um, because it, the pad, there's such a pattern to the process, they're really capable of carrying that out. Um, next slide. Um, and so then there's just also related art projects. And so both of these, um, both of these artworks come from um, different images that were seen at the museum. Um, this, I cannot remember the first one, but the second one was actually a Carrie James Marshall piece. I think the first one was as well, but it was where the artist was sitting there. It was the self image, um, the image on the right where the artist was painting herself. So this student um, recreated an artwork of um, um, herself on the outside and then in the frame um, painting, her, painting her own image. Um, next slide. And so another related artwork, um, this was um, from this school year, where when I went to my um, pre-visit workshop for, um, for CAS, um, I was really impressed by this artwork. Um, and I thought like this, create this, this artwork, Monumento Il Fome. And I thought that it would create a really great opportunity um, for extending into the classroom. And so um, I took a video of it and from all angles, and I used it as one of the pieces for VTS discussion in my classroom. And so um, after discussing that, the student's task was to, um, to, was to create a similar artwork. But um, the prompt that I asked them was, um, if you were really, 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 really hungry, 
or thirsty, what is it, what would it be that you were craving? What really tides you over? And so I gave them two Ziploc bags. This was a home project. They could put the food in, they couldn't put wet food. Um, they could draw pictures if they wanted to, if they couldn't put food in. And so, um, and then we would bring it back and have sort of a museum um, gallery um, to look at one another's artwork. And so this is Madeline's piece that she called um, Coffee and Sugar. And, um, and a really cool thing about this is that after discussing this, we went to, after seeing this artwork, we went on our visit to the museum and the students saw this piece of art and they were just like, so enthralled that they saw something in person in reality that they previously had only seen on screen and so it was really cool to see their reactions and they're like, well, Miss Howard we saw it we saw oh my gosh we saw that one you showed us so it's um you know it just really again really creates that connection for them and um you know just so many opportunities there um and I think that's it for my slide. So, um, so again, I hope that you were able to see how VTS um, and participation in CAS really creates opportunities for um, developing your students and helping them acquire the habits of museum patrons. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Louis Barreto, who will talk about um, how it works in his classroom. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for uh, having me. Uh, I want to start off just by saying thank you to LACMA and MOCA for this great opportunity uh, to have me here today and share my experiences with everybody. Our conversation earlier was so fruitful. I really enjoyed uh, having that conversation with everybody with the BTS. Um, you know, it's very humbling as a, as a public school kid from Reseda, and now I'm here talking to y'all. I think that's really awesome. And also happy Teacher Appreciation Week to all our fellow educators out there. I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate all we've done, all you do for the class and for the kids. Um, and so just a happy Teacher Appreciation Week just to start us off. And we're almost there. Summer break is just a few more weeks away. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, introducing myself and then talking about how v uh, BTS is used in my classroom. So can we move to the next slide, please? So again, my name is Luis Barreto. Um, this is my sixth year um, being a teacher at Cleveland High School in the Academy of Art and Technology, AOET. Uh, I got my BA at, uh, my BA in Art and Art Education at CSUN. Um, at Cleveland, uh, we are a CT or Career Technical Education Pathway. So we focus on graphic design and career education for our students. Um, and just as a quick side note, uh, I would be a terrible communication designer if I didn't try to uh, plug in our social media pages. So feel free to at our academy page, the AOET, if you want to uh, follow us and see what we're doing in the classroom. We try to keep that pretty consistent. Um, I've also had the privilege of working with some of our uh, nonprofit arts organizations in the Valley, uh, specifically 1111, a creative group, a great organization. I highly recommend checking them out. Um, and just a quick shout out to Aaron, Addie, and Miles, the, the foundation of the 1111 group. Um, and then as an art teacher, right, uh, I, I can't have a bio without mentioning my two favorite artists. Uh, right now, Sister Karita Kent and Ai Weiwei are my two big heavy hitters. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. So let's talk about BTS. So can we move to the next slide, please? Great. Uh, so again, BTS in my classroom, I wanna break it down into these four categories for you. Uh, the first one we'll be talking about is the Socratic seminar, um, uh, adaptable discussion formats uh, for the classroom in different subjects. Um, a second thing I'll talk about is student-centered, tailoring the artwork, um, and text also because I, my partner with BTS is Susan Cho. She's our English teacher in the academy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what she does and what our other teachers do. Uh, three, inclusivity. Again, one of the core foundational traits of BTS, adapting for me, adapting for language and acquisition in the classroom. And the last thing I'll talk about is collaboration or collaborative features in the BTS model. And that's including written group activities and special guests. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Awesome. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is the Socratic seminar. Uh, so in our academy in the AOET, we have nine teachers. Uh, we have some graphic design teachers, English teachers, history teachers, our biology teacher, and our chemistry teacher. So um, in our BTS, in in our academy. Even though we all teach different subject matters, uh, we still can use and do use the BTS model in our own curriculum. And so I really want to hone in on this idea of demystifying BTS as an arts only practice 
uh, it can be applied and it can be approached in many different subject matters and it can uh, easily transition itself into whatever subject or, cur or curriculum you're talking about. Um, as mentioned earlier, my BTS partner is our 11th grade English teacher, Susan Cho. Uh, so in, in English, uh, she mentioned to me that she uses uh, the BTS model as a close reading for close reading uh, literature passages. So using a very similar question structure and discussion structure in her classes to encourage uh, student interaction with the text and literature. In graphic design, of course, uh, even though we use commercial design, we focus on commercial design, we're still examining the effectiveness of commercial design in the classroom, again, having these very similar conversations. In history class, uh, the VTS model can be used to connect artwork uh, historically to the subject matter at hand. So whether we're talking different time periods, different people uh, in history, uh, there is always an artwork that, that can be related to that. So using art as a way to preempt uh, these conversations in history. And then in our biology class, or more, more openly our science classes, right? The BTS model can also be used um, as a claim and evidence kind of reasoning, exploring life forms in the scientific model in that aspect. Um, and again, the Socratic method, or the Socratic seminar, sorry, is, is, is great because it's a foundation for students to discuss openly and can adapt to any classroom. So the BTS model uses that very similar ideology in its structure. Next slide, please. So uh, the second thing I want to talk about is student-centered, of course, uh, VTS is student-centered, that is the core foundation of its, of its being, right? Uh, in our graphic design classes, we structure our curriculum in these thematic units uh, throughout the year. And these can be anything from mental health awareness in our 10th grade class, uh, developing professional identities in our 11th grade class, uh, to talking about migration in our 12th grade class. So really a lot of big, open, heavy, ended, open-ended uh, units and, and thematic ideas that we'll be exploring more in depth and then also tailoring that to, to artwork. So when we begin our conversations on these topics, we always try to tie in BTS into our lectures and looking at artwork that can relate to that. So again, BTS can, can be uh, tailored, can be modified as a precursor to prompt discussion with the students and to, to open this, uh, this big door for them as to what we'll be talking about later on. And it's a great model, again, uh, to allow students to, to talk freely, to express themselves, to use personal experiences as some of our participants in the VTS earlier use. They talked about their own personal experiences and that's what we really want to do with the students um, using what they know, their prior knowledge and, and how can we adapt that into the classroom. And uh, of course, like active listening, uh, practicing listening to each other. And, and you know, as our high school students, uh, some of you may know, sometimes struggle with that idea of listening. Uh, so a, a good foundational skill of listening to our peers and then building upon uh, what they've noticed and what they're thinking without a sense of judgment, right? That, that's always the key thing here. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so that leads me straight to uh, the idea of inclusivity, right? Uh, when we have our students, uh, our students' backgrounds, our students' personalities, our students' um, experiences in mind, that that opens the the door to inclusivity, right? How can we make this more inclusive for everybody? Uh, so at Cleveland, we're a predominantly uh, Latino-based uh, student population. The majority of our students are Latino-based students. We're also a Title One school, so we have a lot of students from low-income families and a lot of ELD students from uh, different countries of origin. So it, English is, may not be the primary language that students know in the classroom. And that's something that we as Cleveland and as the majority of LAUSD um, is an issue we face. And how do we adapt to these students? How do we teach them, right? Uh, so with the VTS model, and uh, I can speak only a little bit from what I've experienced. Uh, I'm sure Allison or somebody at MOCA can also talk about how BTS can be adapted uh, in a bilingual setting. Um, that's something I've practiced with my ELD students when I've had students like that. So for me, BTS in a bilingual aspect, uh, used for more language acquisition, used for lowering the barrier of discussion for the students. Um, I've noticed that students feel uncomfortable or not willingly participating simply because they don't feel like their English is good enough or they, they're scared to talk. Right. Um, so how can we remove those barriers? How can we lower those barriers for them so they can participate? I mean, similarly, like uh, I, I was a no sabo kid, right? My Spanish was not fluent. I was not sure of my Spanish speaking skills, but as a teacher, especially as a teacher at Cleveland, 
really practicing my Spanish skills and getting that better. So I've used that in the classroom. I'll do bilingual BTSs. Um, the student can participate in Spanish. Um, that's unfortunately the only other language I know, but uh, they can participate in their, in their native tongue. And then I can translate or do my best to translate for them. And that I've noticed encourages a lot more students, the students that would normally not speak if this was an English only kind of activity. And so that, again, this idea of inclusivity, bringing more students in, into the fold. Um, and then the last thing I do, uh, I kind of stole it from MOCA, uh, the MOCA cast team, uh, but it is a Nearpod activity. So I've noticed that the MOCA cast team uses a written kind of activity, supplemental activity for students. If there's, uh, maybe if we need more participation in the groups, I, I've taken that idea and I modified it into like a Nearpod activity so we can still look at artwork and write about it at the same time. Um, and with a Nearpod, it can uh, include an uh, anonymous submission and it can be in a language of choice. So again, reducing these barriers for uh, encouraging students to participate in, in these BTS discussions and just in discussions in general in the classroom. Next slide, please. Awesome. Uh, these last two slides, I just want to briefly talk about some of my personal experiences with BTS um, and also some of the successes I've had with it and hopefully launch some ideas for you, trying to give you some ideas how you can adapt this and use this in your classroom. Um, so during COVID, I decided to restructure some of my classes, including my AP class that I teach. Um, I figured everybody was stuck at home, just like me. So um, they have nothing else to do besides check their emails. So I emailed a bunch of different professional artists. Um, I used Mocha and Lacmus collections to, to start pinpointing people that I'd be interested in talking to. Maybe they'd be interested in talking to my students. And luckily, I've had about a dozen of them contact me, and I've made these relationships with them. Um, anywhere from here in LA, I've actually worked with Kaijin Fujita, who was in the earlier slide, um, all the way to as far as Maine. Um, so I, I still have these people coming in uh, virtually, some in person if they're, if they're close by, and they'll meet with the kids and they'll talk with them and, you know, give a little uh, guest speaker presentation. And using the VTS system uh, the, in, in the sessions that we have in our, in our lectures, it, it really is a great use of anticipation activity to get these, the kids buy-in, to get them excited, to get them to look more, and then telling them, hey, this artwork that we just saw, is, the artist is coming tomorrow. Um, and that really encourages them more participation. They get very excited. Um, and then similarly also, just on a side note, uh, I spoke with Susan. Susan said that she also uses uh, the model to survey text and passages in her classroom. Um, again, this anticipation activity of getting students to think more critically about the text that they're about to read and get them prepared for the language or for the, the, the plot or any kind of literature structure that, that can be found in the text. Next slide, please. And then the last thing I want to talk with you all about is um, how I use BTS in a peer-to-peer -peer critique session. So in an art classroom, we do a lot of critique sessions. We'll look at other artists' artwork. We'll look at each other's artwork. Uh, and this can be a very intimidating thing for students. Uh, it, it can make them feel very vulnerable um, and understandably too, right? Uh, but the VTS model using this language, using how the discussion is structured can really reduce some of those pressures. And, and I've noticed that, and, and that is a success that I've seen when the VTS model is implemented into the classroom. So when we do critique sessions, every time we do a crit day, uh, I'll use a very similar wording structure. Um, I'll have the kids provide positive feedback, give criticism, um, all in a constructive way to, to help each other learn right, uh, as a group rather than individuals. Uh, and then I, what I started to notice, especially this year, I started to notice that my students, at least in my AP class, were so invested in what we were doing. So it really honed in on this idea of what we were doing. Uh, that they actually asked me to uh, round robin the, the the role of facilitator. So um, as of now, I have not done BTS with them because they do it themselves. Uh, they asked me um, to take over and I gladly give them the, the role and whoever wants to do it that day does it. And all I'm doing is just sitting back, monitoring the conversation. If they have any questions or need me to step in, I'll step in. But for the most part, I'm not doing anything. Um, and that's great. It, it is really encouraging to see how students can take this idea, take this model and really make it their own. And really as teachers, we, we love to see how they can teach themselves, right? And this is a great example of how they are able to take this concept and make it their own and, and you know, use it in their own way, but still following the, the ideology behind it. 
Um, so those are just some of the aspects and, and key things I want to talk about VTS and again, encouraging folks, even if you're not an arts um, uh, teacher or, or have an arts background, this can be very accessible to everybody. Um, it's a very similar structure that I'm sure you use in your classroom already. Um, and that's it. I'm going to, I guess, turn the mic to someone besides. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Lewis, and thank you, Danielle, Allison, and Jean. Um, that was fantastic. It was amazing to hear in Danielle and Lewis's presentations kind of similar ideas reflected back that we experienced in the demonstrations previously. So, and also just to see how um, how VTS can be taken further and expanded and applied in so many different directions. Um, that was especially inspiring to me. Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up for a Q&A now. Um, Jean, I also wanted to invite you to maybe say a few more words about um, joining Contemporary Art Start before we get into the Q&A. Sure. I uh, just prematurely put a few links in the chat. Um, we'd love to have you join us. We are enrolling participants for CAS 2023-24 right now. Um, our application deadline is May 26th, and uh, we are uh, taking applications through that time for third through 12th grade teachers, and uh, professional development will start in July. Thank you so much. We'd love to see you. Thanks, Jean. If anybody has questions um, for any of our wonderful guests today, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourselves. Um, we'd love to hear. We'd love to hear what you're wondering about. Um, I see Carol has her hand raised. Yeah, uh, Danielle, I'd like to ask you a question about the the picture you showed uh, the the feast. Oh. Did anyone comment? And maybe it wasn't an age appropriate thing, but did anyone comment about the skeletons? Did they um, wonder about skeletons? Did you, how did oh, they approach that? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, it was definitely something that was prominent, but um, it didn't become, it, it didn't become anything um, that was um, probably maybe what you're thinking on a level of discussion that adults may <laughs> may bring to the table about it but they did um they did say if i'm remembering correctly like maybe it said like oh there's dead people um or something like that but um um you know with the but nothing that really extended in a in a major way <laughs> well right and I, I certainly was thinking maybe in an older class mm -hmm it might go further, mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, ninth to 12th grade. I I guess I like VTS, but I never quite understand how it gets to maybe, what does it mean? I mean, if you have art with skeletons, you know, and yes, I am thinking of indigenous people and how poorly they've been treated mm -hmm. in our country. Mm -hmm. how, how do you get to that? I, I get to get to it through the students mm -hmm. making comments about it. Maybe older students would. Right. Well, so there are lots of opportunities to um, to extend beyond the VTS discussion itself. So if I'm um, if I'm using if I'm just following the script of VTS, it is just what are the students saying, and you're not injecting as the teacher. I'm not injecting any of my own ideas. Um, but later, aside from the VTS discussion, you can always pull out something that a student said. And so in a sense, your VTS discussion is almost like your motivation um, for a topic. And it actually extends itself, the VTS it model itself extends itself really well in um, with history. A lot of times I do use images from um, in history and having a VTS discussion from that. And then that springboards into whatever learning we're going to be doing. Um, so that would be the way I would use it, but not necessarily during the discussion, but it's a way to really pull out ideas. And then you can highlight those later and extend upon them later for sure. And then you made and in a way that you may not have even gotten those ideas or concepts from students if you hadn't had a discussion 
um, about it, just a very neutral discussion first where everyone feels honored and safe to share their ideas. And then you can pull from there. Thank you. you. Thank you, you're welcome. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. Well, I think it's it's a really good question and it and it comes up and I, I think that what we like to, to think about the focus is not so much on the meaning, but on multiple meanings coming from students grounded observations and that also the sort of the point of the activity is the thinking practice. It's not so much uh, the right answer, but getting used to coming to one's own conclusions with a group. I was going to say, I, I, I really like that piece because it, um, it reminded me of the, of the Last Supper. Like, even though it was the indigenous, you know, kind of, um, it was, that was the theme, but it was kind of, it had a lot of things going on in there, like with the Last Supper. But um, I know with, when I show um, my kids something, I do the same thing. I kind of just, just feed off of what they're thinking, like you said, Danielle, with, um, and then respond to that instead of you know trying to coax them into thinking about something else because you know you can kind of do that too um but i i did that was one of the things i wanted to add but i did have a question are we going to know about the artist that we talked about because i am so curious to know what the meaning of those balloons were <laughs> and what the artists, what their interpretation was. Um, Laura, is it possible to put the image credits in the chat? Yes, I had a feeling that somebody was gonna ask about that. So I oh. already prepared the link nice. <laughs> and I'm putting Thank it in the chat Laura. now. <laughs> yeah, see what you can find and see how what you find builds on what you did. Right, right. Because it, it was um, just the because of, of the active listening from our teachers and the questions that they brought out of us, you know, in explaining what we were trying to how we were interpreting it made it more um, interesting, you know, just listening to the other teachers, you know, give their ideas and opinion and thoughts made it more interesting. Indeed. Any other questions for our guests? Please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the survey link in the chat. Um, if you could fill that out before you take off today, um, we would love to know what you thought of the program. Um, I see Christina has her hand raised. Yeah, hi. I have a question about the CAS um, application. Um, I'm an out of the classroom person, um, but I work with teachers on developing units of inquiry that, that are transdisciplinary. And so I was wondering if that would be something that I would be able to participate in, even though I don't have a roster or um, what would what would that be like? Well, Allison can ch chime in on this, but please join. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really interesting position to be in the cohort in um, as a supporter, as a collaborator. And uh, really, please, please comment if you can find a partner or multiple teachers from your school site to do it together, you can um, build, build on that in the program. Okay. Okay. So if I can encourage uh, rope one of my teachers in <laughs> to come with me, that would be great. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Sure. It's just about 630. Um, do we have any final questions before we say good night? Thank you all so much for being here. This is truly fantastic. I love the collaboration between the MOCA educators and the classroom teachers. Um, you have a really wonderful program going, and I'm so happy we were able to highlight it here at LACMA. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Appreciate it. Let's collaborate more.
Yes, <laughs> let's. I just want to say you. this was this was a great um, workshop um, seminar. I don't know <laughs> our evening with educators, but um, this was really informative. I mean, having um, you know the teachers and just like you said, the collaboration and the different age groups. You know what I mean? The high school, or the elementary, that kind of help because you know they're all kind of seeing the same thing, but you have to meet them where they are in their education. This is a great way to meet students where they are. They um, and it's that's the that's the point. That's the uh, the site of learning. And with peers, they start with where they are and they just go a little bit further. We help them go a little deeper with that. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, do any of our guests wanna say a final word before we take off? I just want to echo Jean's thank you to you all and invite you to yeah join our community of practice our community of reflection if you have any questions or any about the program or about VTS about bilingual VTS I'd love to talk to you I'm going to put my email in the chat um, to keep in touch thank you thanks so much everybody good night good or night. Lewis were you going to say something just thank you thank you everybody had a great conversation with y'all thank you Lewis and Danielle